You are listening to Leaders and Legends, a podcast featuring some of Indiana's most fascinating men and women whose impact has shaped our state, our communities, and us. Join us as we discuss their imprint on our history. Leaders and Legends is brought to you by Veteran Strategies Incorporated, your local veteran business enterprise specializing in public relations, media relations, public outreach, crisis communications, and digital photography. My name is Robert Bain, Principal of Veteran Strategies, former Deputy Chief of Staff to Mayor Greg Ballard, and Communications Director for the Indiana Republican Party. I'm honored to be your host for our discussion. You are listening to Leaders and Legends, a podcast presented by Veteran Strategies, a local veteran public relations enterprise, and sponsored by Girl Scouts of Central Indiana, Garmon Construction, the Crown Plaza Hotel and Grand Hall and Conference Center at Historic Union Station, the law firm of Bose, McKinney, and Evans, and the Bose Public Affairs Group. And finally, the McGinley's Golden Ace Inn, and our favorite, McAllister Machinery, your friendly neighborhood Caterpillar dealer. Thank you for joining us on the Leaders and Legends podcast. You are not going to believe who you're listening to today. And that is an absolute Hoosier legend, former Purdue basketball coach, Gene Cady. Thank you, coach, very much. Well, thank you for saying that. That was awful kind. I appreciate that. Well, not you know, sure it's I, true, but I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> I will say this. All of us who, who bleed cream and crimson and have been IU fans forever, there's not a single one of us who doesn't respect the living hell out of you and didn't cringe when we saw you walk on the court because we knew a battle was about to be joined. So thank you for all the great games and we kind of are still upset at some of the losses well uh, i felt the same way i knew we wouldn't have to be at our best if we're going to win in the assembly hall and it was not uh, a fun time but it was a challenging time and coach knight taught me how to coach better it's interesting i want to talk about that a little bit but i don't want to dominate the conversation by just talking about you and coach knight but let's build on that just real quick Going up up against Knight, who was really at his peak in those 80s and early 90 years when you guys battled, you said it made him a made you a better coach. Talk about that a little bit, because I want to ask also about some other really strong coaches in the Big Ten. Well, I highly respected Coach Knight because he graduated his kids and they played hard. And I met him when I was Eddie Sun's assistant at Arkansas. And Coach Knight had been given a clinic in uh, – Tulsa, and I went to listen, and then uh, he wanted to go fishing in Fayetteville, where Arkansas was, so we he rode home in the car with us, so it was a very intriguing <laughs> visit, to say the least, and I really enjoyed it, and ever since, I've highly respected him. You mentioned Coach Knight graduating his players. This would be the time to point out that you graduated 92% of your players. Why was that so important to you? Well, my degree was uh, one of the reasons I could move on in the coaching world. So my degree at Kansas State, my master's at Kansas State, got me some jobs that probably I couldn't have gotten if I didn't have those type of degrees. So it was just something I felt like if uh, you could be a good athlete, be on scholarship, but if you didn't have your degree, you you couldn't get a better job. So it was just something that uh, I cherished, and and I thought if a coach would graduate his kids like Coach Knight was, they're doing their job. When I found out for sure that you were going to join the Leaders and Legends podcast, I sent an email to about a half dozen Purdue fanatics, whom I know, and suggested they send some questions. And yes, the sir. very first response I got was from a guy named Bill Benner, who I guess isn't oh, a Purdue wow. fanatic, but he thinks the world <laughs> of you. And I, I asked him for some is. questions. Well, Great sports writer. He, Bill Benner has been on the podcast, uh, and he's absolutely wonderful and a great friend of mine, and I wanted to get his input. And first question he asked me to ask you, or suggested I ask you, is what about the influence of your parents, Lloyd and Helen, Katie, and how did they shape you to not only want to be a coach, but to succeed in life? Well, a lot of ways. First of all, dad taught me how to work. 
my mom taught me how to respect and love people. And they were just a great team. And they taught them, uh, they raised my, my sister Norma and I were raised by the right people. So they got me started on the right foot. I had great coaches in high school and junior college and at K-State. So those things are kind of just all wove together and, and helped develop my coaching career. But it all started with my parents. You grew up in Kansas, which, as we know, was a hotbed of basketball. Is that kind of where you caught the bug? Because we know you played several sports, both in high school and college. Yes, uh, Kansas is a lot like Indiana. Uh, the, the tournament times were special. If your team, if you coached in high school, if your team got to the state tournament, that was really special for you. They got the whole community excited and got behind you. It was just fun to be part of that. That's the way it was in Indiana when I got there. So that's why I guess I was brought up in the right uh, environment because of the influence of the uh, Kansas schools. And I understand uh, from reading about you that there was a formative event that happened to you in high school. And that's when you got hit in the head with a shot put during a track meet. <laughs> no, I was doing practice. But uh, <laughs> that does not surprise you, does it? Because you know there's something wrong with me. <laughs> <laughs> Did anybody ever bring that up uh, later in life to say, well, now we know why you are? Well, nobody nearly knows that. So it's not something I was really proud of. and uh, It was not uh, – a fun experience or was just dumb on my part to be, I was yelling to the teammate running around the track or my, my uh, teammate, <laughs> the shot putter was the state champion shot putter. So you could throw it about 54 feet or so. So it hit me in the head and I was goofing off and talking. And, uh, and uh, it was one of those things where I should have been paying attention. What is also, it was brought up during a lot of the broadcasts during uh, the basketball games was your, career as a football player and the fact that you were drafted by the Steelers what drew you to football and why did you decide uh, not to pursue that career anymore well a lot, a lot of reasons first of all um, I led in four sports in college so track taught me about conditioning football taught me about toughness uh, I led in basketball in junior college so I played basketball until I was a junior and then I, when I transferred to Kansas State from Garden City Juco I went to Tex Winter at K-State and asked him if I could come out. He says, no, we watched you play. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, But I came good, became good friends with the basketball players. And just uh, sat behind Tex's bench and tried to learn from watching him coach. And it was just a matter of uh, the fact that uh, they had great team players on that team. And they went to the Final Four. They had Bob Boozer, Jack Parr, Roy DeWitt, uh, Bob. Uh, they just had a great team. And I just, I just followed them all all the way to when they went to Seattle and played Seattle. So uh, a lot of reasons I coached basketball was, first of all, in Kansas, it's cold in the winter, and I didn't like playing outside. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so when I came back to Kansas, I had my degree, but it was late August, and I had hurt my knee with a Steelers, so I came back and didn't have a job. So I applied for this job at Beloit High School, the only job open as far as coaching was a head basketball job, and that's how I got started, by coaching uh, high school basketball in Beloit, Kansas. And it seems like you took the route that a lot of people, you know, you kind of take the, not only in coaching, but in life, you start out at a lower level, hone your skills, move, 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 move up, 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 up. Yeah. You did that. And what was it like coaching at a junior college, Hutchinson Junior College, you coach there. Did that help you prepare for the bright lights of the Big Ten a few decades later? What was it about coaching junior college that you enjoyed? Uh, without a doubt, it got me started on the right foot. It taught me how to recruit. You had to go out and sell your program. Hutch was a great school because it was the site for the nice junior college tournament. It still is. And was always very exciting in March there. And if you could get your team in the National Junior College Tournament, you were really a, a happy time in your coaching career. So uh, it was just one of those things where I was at the right time, the right place. My The uh, president of the Garden City Juco, uh, when I was there at Garden City, became the uh, president of uh, 
touched Juco, and that's why they hired me because he knew me. So, uh, and Sam Butterfield was the head coach there, and he hired me because he knew me. I played ball and at Garden City, and he was a high school coach at Garden City. It was just a, a lot of people touch your lives and help you. It's not what you know until you know. And uh, it's just one of those things where everything kind of fell together, and I got lucky. How much of your career would you say is luck? Right place at the right time. Well, at the right, right place, right time, hard work, uh, keep people with respect, uh, make sure that uh, you teach. Uh, coach Wooden taught me that coaching is uh, – Coach Lavin said one time he was just a coach, and Coach Wooden jumped on him and said, what do you mean just a coach? A, a coach is a teacher. He's not a coach. He teaches how to do things right, and and because uh, Wooden was a good friend of mine, and I learned a lot of things from him. so. I used to go to his clinics. He used to do. He used to do seven up clinics around the nation. I used to listen to all of them. So I used his practice schedule the T. I uh, used his press, uh, his two two one zone press. Uh, used a lot of his offensive schemes. So I, because he was a Purdue graduate, I became close to him. I was going to ask you about him later, but to stay on that for just one second. Okay. When so Steve Lavin, who is part of your coaching tree. And I was going to ask you about that later as well. He's at UCLA. And here you are at Purdue, both of you in a sense, following Wooden to a certain degree. Wooden didn't coach at Purdue, but he was an all American at Purdue. Right. Did you feel any sort of not pressure? Isn't the right word, but like these are the standards for which I'm going to be held and I need to meet or exceed these standards based on excellence. I didn't feel any pressure or stress. I Somebody said, yeah, you don't feel it because you give it. <laughs> you give stress. <laughs> <laughs> that's, but, what, uh, that's what Don, Don I didn't Shula really feel said. I stress or pressure. I just felt like I tried to do, keep my job, you know, move on. It's, I only had one-year contract, so you're trying to survive. with survival of the fittest, like March is. So uh, uh, just one of those things, you grow up in the coaching world under the circumstances of uh, the, the situation at the time. But now they have like five year contracts and get paid a million dollars and so on. So I was brought up at the, I guess at the right time. I had with high school, it's a great experience for me. I still talk with my ex players. They're 74 now. And I still talk to some of them. <laughs> and uh, the parents in those days were very supportive. If you got, I used to give paddles and phys ed with my fraternity, paddle whack up once, you know. They didn't do something that they were asked to do. And then they get home, they get one from their parents. Now I'd get fired or sued. So the parents were very supportive, <laughs> and, and uh, they still talk to a lot of them. In 1975, you move on to Arkansas, and an assistant under one of the really terrific coaches in the last quarter of the 20th century, and that's Eddie Sutton. It was at that time that you made it to the Final Four. And yeah, I don't know if he was – what you say? It's in 1978 in St. Louis. That's right. One of the players you had on that team went on to an incredibly successful career in the NBA, and it really is an all-time great. I want to ask you about Sidney Moncrief. What was it like to coach him? Oh, man, it was a joy. Uh, great young man, a hard worker, good leader, uh, Was uh, wanted to win in the worst way, uh, probably the First or second best player ever coached next to Glenn Robinson. So, uh, uh, great, great guy. And he was known as a defensive stopper in the pros. Is he one of the best defensive players you ever coached in college? Oh, yeah. Yeah, and of course, on our team, we had Ronnie Brewer, who was a point guard. So, we had the ball handling handled by him. And then we had uh, Marvin Delph, who was a shooter. And Sidney was, uh, became a better defensive player because uh, we needed him. And I mean, he was a good player on offense, too, though. He was a great all-around player, an all-American. What was it like to uh, be associated with Eddie Sutton? What, you, what did he teach you about coaching? Everything. I mean, he was the best coach I was ever influenced by. Uh, he and uh, Bud Presley, a junior college coach in California, uh, Boyd Grant, the coach of Fresno State, uh, my high school coach, uh, Merwin Wilson, uh, 
all those Tex Winter, all those guys influenced me, and I stole a lot of stuff from them. So uh, Eddie Sutton was a great, great uh, motivator. Uh, expected the uh, best out of you, and was a great teacher, great defensive coach because he played for Mr. Iba at Oklahoma State. So he was a defense was uh, uh, his forte, but he also was a great shooter. And uh, in uh, high school and from uh, Kansas and went to Oklahoma State, but Mr. Ida wouldn't let him shoot much. And he was always <laughs> a guy that if he had a good shooter at Arkansas, he let him shoot because he wasn't going to be – he wasn't going to punish him like that. he thought somebody punished him at Oklahoma State. So even though Mr. Ida was a uh, Hall of Fame coach. Did you ever coach against uh, Eddie Sutton when you made it to Purdue? Yes, I did. At one time uh, – uh, down in Tampa, uh, we played in the NCAA against them, and they beat us like I think ten points or so. So it was not fun. I didn't like playing against them. <laughs> you they move had, on they after, had a great uh, team too. Is that when he wasn't it? Was he at Kentucky then, or was it? Was he coach at like Oklahoma no, State was, or something? Uh, he afterwards? was still at Arkansas. Still at Arkansas. Okay. You got your first head coaching job in 1978 for Western Kentucky. So now you've moved from Kansas, one of the hotbeds of college basketball, and now you're in Kentucky, which is certainly right up there at the top. Was there a difference between the two states, as you remember, in terms of, of fan support and just fervor for the game? Not much. Uh, very similar. Uh, my daughter still lives in uh, Bowling Green. My grandson uh, lives in uh, Arkansas yet, uh, Kyle. So uh, uh, it, it, it Western Kentucky was a great experience too. I'll tell you what, every stop I made was a great time and still have friends there at all those places. Then there's Western Kentucky was a hotbed of basketball in those times. If you remember, they went to the final four and uh, I don't forget what year it was, but it was a, it was a good time. We had great fans, still have great fans. And uh, it's just uh, something that really helped my career. While you were there, Western Kentucky, you had a pretty darn good assistant coach named Bruce Weber. How did you meet Bruce? Well, Bob Gottlieb was the assistant coach at Kansas State uh, under Jack Hartman. And uh, he came to watch me practice one time at uh, Hutch and didn't like, the, didn't like the way I was coaching. So we kind of got into it. I think he liked the fact that I talked back to him. So when he saw me get the job at Western Kentucky, he says, hey, I got this young coach at Milwaukee coaching high school. You might want to interview for your assistant coach at uh, Western. He knew I needed assistance, so I interviewed him and Clem Haskins and Bruce Weber. So I had a great staff at uh, Western. And oh, no Bruce kidding. Bruce was my assistant 17 years, one year at uh, Western and 16 years at Purdue. I didn't know that about Clem Haskins, who went on to coach, was it Minnesota? Minnesota? Yeah. That's right. Yes. Yeah, I, you know it, it, it. It's one of these things where, uh, when people who are about to meet uh, my former boss, Mayor Greg Ballard, Mayor of Indianapolis, and they ask, "What should I say?" or "You know, what should I talk to him about?" My answer yeah. is always compliment his staff, because right. Mayor Ballard is incredibly proud of and very protective of the people who used to work for him, and oh, gives yeah. him and he gives them all the credit. And it seems like coaches are the same way, that, that they really, really work hard so that their assistants have the same opportunities that they have. Yes. Well, Clem was an All-American at Western, and when I got the job, I was looking for somebody that had an affiliate uh, with uh, Western, and uh, he had been there and uh, needed a job, and I interviewed him and really liked him and hired him as my assistant. And then uh, when I left and went to uh, moved on, uh, I made sure that he got the job at Western. And then when he got uh, success there, then he uh, got the job in Minnesota. And we st- we talked two days ago. So he lives in Campbellsville, Kentucky now. So uh, great friend, great family, uh, great player, and great and great coach. So uh, I'm just I'm glad you brought brought Clem up. Well, in 1980, and we're going to talk about some of your former players who became coaches because there's one who's doing an outstanding job at Purdue right now. But in 1980, you moved on to Purdue. And I'm going to read, just take a minute, to read your resume 
at Purdue and as a result of you being at Purdue. Six regular season Big Ten championships, including the uh, heralded three straight outright championships, 94, 95, 96. Seven-time Big Ten Coach of the Year awards, five-time National Coach of the Year awards, elected into the Indiana Basketball Hall of Fame in 2001, elected in the Kansas Sports Hall of Fame in 2007, elected into the Purdue Athletic Hall of Fame in 2010, and inducted into the College Basketball Hall of Fame in 2013. You took this job at Purdue. You entered into the Big Ten when not only, of course, was Coach Knight in Indiana riding high, but you also had Judd Heathcote at Michigan State. You had Lou Henson at Illinois. You had some very, very strong programs in what was arguably arguably the biggest and most talented league in the country. When you decided to go to Purdue, what was going through your mind? Were you thinking – this is my shot at the big time or, oh my God, how am I going to win a <laughs> league like this? Uh, good story. Uh, I was trying to get a coaching clinic started at Western. And so uh, the guy that owns Wendy's, uh, Dan Davis, flew me up to Milwaukee. We and we, see, we wanted to see if Al McGuire would, uh, at Marquette would come be one of our speakers. So mm. he did and we did. And I got to be pretty close to Al and he told me, when I interviewed for the Purdue job, not to take it because he said you'll never beat Knight. Don't take that job. <laughs> Stay where you are. <laughs> so, but I went against his word uh, because uh, the league was Big Ten was uh, had great TV, and I thought if the kids' parents couldn't get to the games, at least they could watch their children play on TV. And it just hasn't had great attendance in Mac Arena, so it was just just a great opportunity. Didn't pay much, but it was a great opportunity, and the friends I have great friends still there. Well, and and Purdue, as as their fans will note, were just coming off a Final Four appearance in 1980 with uh, Joe Barry Carroll, in which they right. I think that they lose to Purdue, or excuse me, they lose to UCLA in the Final Four. Is that right? And Louisville ended up beating yeah, UCLA Kiki, for the Kiki national Vanguard championship. Beat them. Yep. Yep. I went to that so game. You, Really? Yeah, I, I didn't have any idea. It's going to be interviewed with a job like uh, a couple months later. I coached a USA team in in uh, Colorado Springs because I got started with USA basketball. And in those days, to develop Olympic players, they had the East teams, the West teams, the South team, the North team. And they played a four-team thing in Colorado Springs to develop college players for the Olympics. And uh, they asked me to coach the South squad, which I did, and we won the gold medal. And Fred Schaus happened to be the assistant coach at Purdue, and he saw me coach that team. So when Lee Rose left to go to South Florida, he told George King that I had to look at that guy at Western Kentucky and interview him. So that's how I got him um, started at Purdue because of my experience coaching the USA team, and Fred Schaus liked the way I coached and, and recommended me to George King. That's how it all got started. Did you ever uh, uh, send a note to any of the people who said you couldn't beat Knight when you used to beat him? No. <laughs> no. I was trying to, trying to win the next game. No. You're just trying to survive in the Big Ten. Yeah, they said, who was the toughest team to play in the Big Ten? I said, whoever you played next. It didn't make any difference <laughs> whether you're in Michigan or Michigan State or Illinois, uh, Northwestern, Wisconsin. They were all good. So I didn't make either Ohio State. So it was a, you know, a situation where uh, you just had to survive, keep moving. When you took the job at Purdue, was there any pressure to beat Indiana specifically? And and the reason that I bring it up is I think of uh, Coach Harbaugh up at Michigan, who clearly was hired in in some regards because Michigan keeps losing to Ohio state Harbaugh sure. hasn't been able to beat him. There's tremendous pressure there. Did you feel specific pressure to beat IU? Well, I didn't, but the fans did. They talked about a lot in the summer golf outings, how you better beat Indiana next year and you, that sort of thing. But I was, like I said, though, I was more worried about here. We played next. 
so whether it was Big Ten or, or uh, whoever, because we had it, we always played tough schedules. So uh, it was a situation where I didn't feel the pressure from it because I think when you coach as long as I had to get in there, pressure is just part of your life, uh, and you don't really sense it. You just you just keep working. And you know why you started to say something a while ago? The reason we won at Purdue or wherever I coach is because we always had pretty good players or great players and a great staff. You never do it by yourself. You always got it. It's a family. It's a family situation where you work together. That's what you try to teach your players. I'm reading this uh, book about the Yankees right now about Joe Torre, and that's the philosophy he had. It's about it's about family, everybody working together. And uh, that's exactly what I believe. One of the things that, that Coach Knight said when asked about coaching, he said the highest compliment you can give a coach is to – feel like it's worth a few points just having them sitting on the bench. Did you feel like when you were coaching that you gave the team an advantage just because you prepared them and you were sitting on the bench? Well, I didn't think that. I don't think uh, individually, but I think it's true because I believe what Coach Knight says about that is if you don't prepare your team – uh, defensively, offensively, out of bounds plays, how to be depressed. You got to teach all the stuff to get past wherever you're playing next. And certainly the guy on the bench can make the right call. And then sometimes you blame yourself for losing because you didn't make the right call during a game. I blame myself for the losses a lot of times, but I didn't come out and verbally say it. But, uh, <laughs> you know, it's just one of those things you thought to yourself that if I had done a better job, made the right call. I'm sure some of the fans thought that, but you know, that's one of those things where you just live with that and move on. Do you feel the, the fans at Purdue directly influenced the game that they, they helped Purdue players win just by their fervor and their love of the program? No question about it. Mac Arena is one of the best home court advantages in America. Uh, at least when I coach there, can't speak for them now, but, I uh, went to a couple of games in the last couple of years, and I felt like there's still the advantage is there. But uh, it certainly has great enthusiasm. It's usually sold out. And we were sold out for 10 years in a row at Purdue. Us and uh, uh, the United Center, where Michael Jordan was playing, it's kind of the two venues in America that were usually sold out. So uh, it was. A, it's a, just a great place to watch basketball and uh, play basketball and have great enthusiasm for the game. I hate to bring this up, but it's a true story based on a friend of mine who was a bookmaker. And he said the two biggest home court advantages in college basketball that influenced the line of a game were the pit at New Mexico right. and Mackey, Mackey Arena at Purdue. Yep. Yeah, I believe that. I agree. I, I, the pit is a great advantage. Where I saw Valvano win a national title once. That was beautiful. Absolutely. You couldn't find anybody to hug. <laughs> <laughs> Running around the court. Looking for you were listening to, to Leaders and Leaders and Legends, a podcast presented by Veteran Strategies, a local public relations enterprise, and sponsored by Girl Scouts of Central Indiana, Garmon Construction, the Crown Plaza Hotel and Grand Hall and Conference Center at Historic Union Station, the law firm of Bose, McKinney, and Evans, and the Bose Public Affairs Group, the McGinley's Golden Ace Inn, and McAllister Machinery, your friendly neighborhood Caterpillar dealer. Thank you for joining us on the podcast today. Our guest is true, true Hoosier legend, former Purdue basketball coach Gene Cady. Is there a Hoosier leader you particularly admire or legend, not even related to sports? Is there someone who you've really taken a, a, a real look at and said, this guy or, or lady is doing it right? Well, Coach John Wooden, you know, when Wooden was there, he was player of the year three times nicely. Uh, as you know, what he did when he went to UC, was he, at UCLA, he's been unprecedented. So, president. So, it's, it's a, one of those things where, I think the president they have now at uh, Purdue is tremendous. The athletic director and the assistant AD, Jason, is tremendous. Uh, uh, I just, it's uh, a lot of people in Indiana influenced my career. Uh, 
a lot of players. We have 16 guys make first team all Big Ten, so all those people was very influential. Uh, on and on and on. You can go on and name a lot of guys. And some of them still work at Purdue. Todd Foster's in the academics. Brian Cardinal works in John Purdue Club, I believe. So uh, it, it, there's a lot of people that still works at Purdue and is influenced by the, the fact that, that, it, that I was able to have them work with me. You know, you mentioned Brian Cardinal. He, he would certainly be on the Mount Rushmore of the Purdue pl- basketball players who IU fans just couldn't <laughs> stand. And I say that exactly. as a compliment, of course. Were you aware of how much IU fans couldn't stand Brian Cardinal because Cardinal hustled his tail off and kept beating us? Oh, I mean, yeah. Did you get some pleasure in that? Oh, like, yeah. yeah. All right, Brian, we're going to Assembly Hall tomorrow. Give him hell. Well, I never said that, but he did it. But uh, <laughs> his dad, you know, was a trainer in Illinois for Lou. Lou is a good friend and a great coach, Lou Henson. And, uh, we recruited Brian Cardinal. I never thought we had a chance in the world to get him because I thought Illinois would take him, you know. But uh, we got lucky, and he liked uh, uh, Purdue, and he came over and played for me, and he beat him eight, ten, eight times in a row. It was unbelievable. <laughs> so uh, we got lucky again. So it's uh, he, he's a great story and uh, has a great uh, had had great influence on my career. When you walk into Mackey Arena – is there a certain game or maybe play or player that enters your mind first? Well, no, a lot of them. Um, I could go on and on and on. I got so many. I mean, uh, please do. You got sixteen guys make first team all Big Ten. You've had a pretty good I think, a bunch of guys that Bruce Weber did a great job recruiting Kevin Stallings. You know, on on and on and on. So, uh, uh, Conzo Martin. So. Uh, Link Garner. So it's a, uh, you know, you could, Matt Waddell. So you could just go on and on and on and, and have a whole list of guys that made the the uh, tradition so good there. Is there a particular, or maybe two or three games that you can think of that where the crowd was just so electric or the stakes were so high that that you just can't get it out of your mind when you walk in there and you look around and go, yeah, this is the <laughs> building where, and I'm thinking, and, and correct my memory if it's wrong, didn't you beat IU in the last game of the Big Ten season and it cost cost them either a share of the Big Ten title or cost them the title outright? Uh, I don't remember that, but I think that happened one year. I don't remember what year it was, but I think it happened one year, but they did the same thing to us once. You know, it, it wasn't just us. It was. It happened back and forth. I think we beat Boyd Grant in Fresno State one time. I thought that was a huge win. Boyd Grant was one of my favorite coaches of all time, uh, and we won their tournament at their on their court when and they were supposed to be the <laughs> hardest place to win a game on the road in the nation, and we won that at their place. And I thought that kind of turned my career around nationally. Uh, uh, the first time we beat IU at home. On our court, uh, I remember Kevin Stallings did two free throws to win that game, uh, and that was a, a my first year there. And that was a in the big. It was in wasn't in eighty. It was eighty one February of eighty one, but or March, and that was a good win because we kind of beat a team that everybody wanted us to beat bad, but by the same token, it kept us alive in the Big Ten. So uh, a lot of games throughout the night na- throughout the time uh, were. Uh, Important, but by the same token, it was just one of those things we kind of, we expected to win. You know, I didn't think we were going to win, but I, we expected to win. Did you take the losses at Mackey harder because you lose on your home court and you just have a different sense of deflation because you didn't defend your home turf? No doubt about it, because you feel like you let the fans down, feel like you didn't do a good job teaching and practice, that sort of thing. And I always blame myself when I was looking through your career in the last few days and looking at some of the pictures, there was a picture and I remember seeing it at the time when I was younger. I don't think I was in the military. I think it was even earlier than that, in the early to mid eighties where there's a picture of you and coach Knight has his hands around you. Like he's trying to calm you down because you've got this fierce <laughs> look on your face. What's it well, like? I got that to be... picture up here on my wall. Oh, you do? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
What's it yeah. like to be told to calm down or to be, uh, you know, uh, counseled to keep cool by Bob Knight? Uh, it was unusual to say the least. Uh, he, <laughs> one time we were playing at assembly hall and we were behind two and Link Donner shot a three at the buzzer and I thought he got fouled. So I'm chasing the, uh, referees out of the, uh, assembly hall up the hallway there to tell you, show some guts and call a foul, even though it's an assembly hall and against coach Knight, which I didn't say that, but that's what I thought. And, uh, uh, somebody's tucking my elbow, and it was Coach Knight. He says, I don't like the way you shook my hand. I said, well, I don't give a – you know, whoa, 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 whoa. we won't say the words on TV and what you thought. And I thought afterwards, now, why did I act like that? Because I always liked – respected Coach Knight so much. And the next year at the Orlando at the Big Ten tournament – or Big Ten uh, meetings, he treated me like a long-lost brother. And I thought, wow, he must have, he must have liked the fact I talked back to him. So and that's kind of the way our friendship – got started on a positive note because I think he thought I, he knew I recruit, respected him and uh, I know I respected him. So it was one of those things where it was, it was a mutual friendship. You know, I hate to say this, but as someone who doesn't understand how you look at it on TV and whether it's, you know, John McEnroe or Jimmy Connors or, or AJ Foyt or, or you or coach Knight or whomever. Uh, right. I don't understand how you guys don't get more angry. <laughs> like I don't understand. I think you guys are more well-behaved than, than most people I know would be. The stakes are so high. Everybody's watching it's these are important games. You've got to placate the fan base. You've got to justify your contract or your coaching. I'm really surprised that that you guys keep it together as well as you do. I'll tell you why. Because our wives, you want her mad at me for acting like a jerk, and my mother would call <laughs> me in Sacramento, and chew me out for cursing during the game. Dad's <laughs> teaching me lip reading. Knock it off. So you know that's why because of our wives and our mothers. <laughs> did you ever feel like you crossed the line and, and had to go back to a you know a, a referee and say you know look last time I saw you I really lost it I apologize oh yeah oh yeah yeah I talked to Ted Valentine two days ago and said that uh, you know I'm sorry or I said that I was that jerk a lot of times and, but he said that's okay coach I know you're trying to win a game so and I talked to uh at Hightower down in Florida a couple of months ago, he's down at Kurt Clausen's place, got to see him, got to see Randy Whitman down there. So it's just good to see people you had battles with. Talk about a little bit about some of the players you coached against. You coached against, in your time in the Big Ten, some of the greatest players in the history of that conference. And we're going to talk about some of the players oh, you coached here in a minute. But you are there any of them that uh, – Calvert well, Chain. Isaiah Thomas comes to, come to first. He was a hard cookie to guard. So uh, he was tough, and he was tough. He was a, very competitive, and I highly respected him. Uh, there's so many of them. There's so many – I don't – you have to name so many, and uh, you could name some of them, of course uh, – didn't play against Magic because he left before I got to Michigan State. But uh, Michigan State had a lot of great players. But uh, 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 Scott Scott uh, played at Michigan State, the guard. Scott, uh, I can't think of his name. I'm sorry, last name. But he was a tough cookie too, the guard. So uh, tried to get him to kind of Purdue. I couldn't get him. But uh, Skiles, Scott Skiles, Skiles, Scott Skiles. Yeah, another one that was. Uh, I lost to recruiting that I really wanted. But uh, uh, every team had great players on it at some point. And uh, they all, uh, they were just hard to guard. It's hard to contain and keep from beating you. So uh, you worked hard at it in practice to curtail it, but sometimes it didn't work. Sometimes they were better than you. Let me throw a couple of of names out there real quick before we move on. Uh, Chris Weber. Well, he's one of the Fab Five, so uh, that, yeah, he was very hard to guard. So, and uh, he had a couple other guys in that that team that was not bad. One of them still does mounting, and uh, uh, 
he was a Toronto when I was there. What the heck is his name? So um, Jalen Rose. Yeah, Jalen Rose was at Toronto when I was there. We had a lot of laughs about how. They were always afraid of me because they, they said I always looked so mean on TV. And said, <laughs> so, so anyway, I don't think he's afraid, but he thought I think he, it was one of those things where he, we respected each other. You mentioned earlier about Lou Lou Henson and your friendship with him. Were you also close with uh, Judd Heathcote? Very close, probably the best. Next to night, probably the best friend coach in the league. Judd is a very dear friend. Coach Izzo had me come up and talk uh, at his banquet he had for Judd a couple years ago, so that was fun. Yeah, Judd was a fine coach, special character, too. Great coach, great guy, good friend, good golfing buddy. One of those rare friendships you have in coaching that uh, you don't get very often. When you look at the coaching job, you mentioned him. Let's just mention him and talk about him for just a little bit that Tom Izzo has done at Michigan State. Very special. There, I'm, I'm for, unbelievable. For, for the generation of coaches who kind of came after you and Knight and Henson, um, does he stand out in your mind as a singular, singularly talented and accomplished basketball coach, not only in the Big Ten but throughout the country? Nationally. Not a question about that. That's very true. He and Coach Weber and I and Judd would run around together at the Final Four uh, when we'd all go together to meet them. We'd always were buddies and, and uh, went to bars and stuff together. So uh, he, Izzo was a young coach. Chris or uh, Coach Weber was a young coach, and we all we all good friends. Still are. We've talked about coaching a little bit. Let's talk about recruiting. You have a famous quote about recruiting, which I'm going to mention right now. Coach Gene Cady once said that recruiting is a lot like shaving. If you miss a day, you look like a bum. Yeah, I got that from the Arizona State uh, football coaches because the uh, Troy Young was their trainer. And I used to sit, go out to the – because I was a big football fan. I used to go out and sit on the sidelines and listen to their football coach. I loved listening to him. And I got that from their assistants, that saying. And I thought it was very apropos, and I always used it. And I stole it from them. They were the only state football coaches. So, uh, and Troy Young was a, a teammate of mine in high school in Larned, Kansas. And then he became the trainer at Arizona State. So, and we still talk. I still talk to him. Did you enjoy recruiting? Oh, yeah. I like selling. I go in the home. Uh, when I went into the home to recruit, Bruce Weber was usually at my side or Kevin Stallings. And uh, if the if the uh, prospect would not respect his mother, pay cook and have good manners with her, we would leave early. Because if they didn't respect their mother, how in the world is he going to respect me? Because I was nuts. You know, so, <laughs> so, uh, so, it, so we, uh, we put a lot of, uh, calculation into how the young man uh, respected his mother. Do you, but, can you, you know, think dads, they think they right, all the dads think their kids can play, you know, but the mothers are with the child more than the dad. So they understand the, the situation better. Were the mothers more concerned about how are you going to treat my son as opposed to oh, yeah. is my son going to get to play? Is he going to? Not so much about to get to play, but they wanted to know about uh, academics and about uh, tutors and stuff like that that was really important. Where do they eat? Where do they live? Stuff like that. How do they get home? How many times do you get to watch them on TV and all those things that would be able to watch if they couldn't get to the game. Do we get Can tickets th- on the road? Things like that. <laughs> Can you think of a player or two who you recruited the hardest and maybe they came to Purdue or maybe they didn't, but you're like, man, these three or four kids I recruited like absolute crazy. Well, Glenn Robinson. Yeah. He was the one that probably recruited the hardest and we got lucky because his mother and his high school coach liked us. So, uh, especially his mother and uh, between us and UNLV down to the last two. So uh, 
And it, why do you it, think it, he it, came? It, you said his mother, but why do you, Glenn Robinson, for those who don't know, was the number one recruit in the country, I believe. It was either him or Weber, yeah. Chris Weber at the time. And it was a very talented class. Alan Henderson went to IU, but there were a lot of really strong players everywhere. Why do you think Glenn Robinson chose Purdue? Well, uh, I was on a radio show in Chicago one day, and uh, his high school coach is Willie Little. And uh, coach of the high school there in, uh, I'm, uh, I think it was Chicago Circle. And they had me on his radio show, and they were, he, he was going to go to his Willie Little school there in Chicago. But his mother had been down to her mother's funeral in, in Alabama and heard the interview about how Glenn was going to go to to uh, Circle. And I, she heard the radio interview coming home from the funeral on, uh, from O'Hara, going home to the house from the, from the airport. And when soon as we got home, because we been, we'd been, had been through the recruiting process, he had been to visit, he, we'd been sales pitch, been to her home, that sort of thing. So when she got to the house, she called up, Glenn and sort of, no, you're not going there. You're going to Purdue because his, his mother saved us because of an interview she heard. So, yeah, <laughs> and how was, quickly after he stepped on the court at Purdue, because am I right? And remember, he was prop 48 his first year. Yes. As a layout his freshman year. Yeah. Right. How soon did you realize this guy is every bit of the talent? that we thought he was going to be. He is living up to the hype every day. First day, first practice. <laughs> year he didn't play. So uh, we had a janitor there, a, a custodian there, in the, who, who always made sure they were my best friends wherever they were. Watched him play the first practice. <laughs> he came up to me and said, Coach, you got to let the big dog eat. <laughs> and he called him the big, that's how he got his name by one of the custodians there at Mackey. So that's how he got his name because one of our custodians really liked him and said, he can play, coach. You got to get him. <laughs> so he did, he did. got that nickname at Purdue. He didn't have it. I thought he had it before then, but he got it at Purdue because someone, a uh, uh, custodian at the think. gym said that's that. That's the story I'm sticking with. I'm not <laughs> sure about that, but that's my story. Let me mention a couple of other players real quick. Troy Lewis. Great shooter, great friend, still talk to you. He works for Victory Food Company in Dayton to this day. We talk about, well, I'd say once or twice every two months. Great shooter from uh, Anderson, the wigwam. Uh, just a tremendous, he's one of the guy. he and Todd Mitchell and Everett Stevens are the three guys that kind of, and Melvin McCann and Kip Jones kind of get him to start first five great starting five together. Uh, and uh, I was at Purdue. That was a great tremendous. human being, great guy. Had a great. He another. His mother was the reason we got him, Julia. So uh, he and Todd Mitchell was a great player, and Everett Stevens was a great player. Everett still works in Lafayette. So uh, he. It's just one of those things where we got lucky. You know, we got three guys, the triplets, and they were fun to coach too. They went to class. Brad, they all got the degree. They all got the degrees. I was very proud of that. Conzo Martin. Oh, boy. Well, special, special. Pro- I want to. My wife's daughter is a movie producer in, in uh, LA or a director in Lisbon, Chicago, in uh, New York. She's a lawyer. I'm trying to get her to make a movie out of Conzo. So. Uh, probably won't happen, but I'd like for it to someday. He came to Purdue, recruited him out of East St. Louis, had a great mother. His mother was the best, still is. And uh, he came to Purdue, and Denny Miller, our trainer, said, Coach, uh, Conzo will never play for us. I said, what are you talking about? He kept playing. He's a great player, made all of Missouri. He said, well, he's got bone on bone in his knees. He can hardly walk. He can hardly, he's about crippled. I said, what? So, but they didn't know Conzo very well. And uh, he worked, ran the stadium stairs, lifted weights, and got his legs where you'd never know that he had that situation like, what, six months later. He became one of the best 
get open players in the, in the Big Ten ever. So then he plays for us, and we win, I, I don't know, three Big Ten championships, I think, in a row with him. I'm not sure he was part of that, but I think he was. And uh, goes to Europe, comes home. He plays with C's for a while, comes home and says one day, says, Coach, I don't feel very good. So why don't you get, get a doctor examine you, dumb dumb. So, okay. So he goes to the doctor and he had lung cancer. So then he gets that chemo and stuff and gets that cleaned up. And then he becomes a, you know, very successful coach. You know, he got the Southwest Missouri State job, went to Tennessee, went to Berkeley. Now he's at Missouri. So I'm always, I've been trying to get. My daughter-in-law to make a movie out of him because he, he's a special story, special guy, special player. He's one of those players when you coach him, you can try to do drills and stuff to get people open, but he'd get open on his own. He was clever about getting open, and I always think during the game, how do you do that? You know, you don't think that very often about your players because you know you taught him right, but not right. Conlo. He taught himself how to do it. He was just a special, special person. Still is. Uh-huh. Last one we'll do is Brad Miller. Oh boy, yeah, he's a dandy. I love I love coaching him. He was a he's a character. Uh, has a TV and radio show, hunting show in I think in Sacramento. No, he used to anyway. I don't know if he still does it not, but he was from Kendallville. He's about six ten. I don't know uh, all about his high school coaching and stuff, but I really liked him and his his. Uh, Brothers were good players. And uh, uh, he was not a guy that was a beat to the – Carson Cranham, he didn't, beat to, he didn't beat to the average drummer. You know, he was different. Of course, <laughs> take it for himself. It was not a bad thing. It was just different. He was okay. He came to me one day and said, Coach, I'm going to quit. I said, what are you talking about? You're a sophomore or a junior. I forget which it was. He said, I'm going to start a bar. He said, a tavern. I said, what? How are you going to pay for it? He said, well, the alumni will pay for it. Said, hey, when you quit, the alumni is going to be, disown you. What are you talking about? He said, okay, and he left. <laughs> <laughs> then he came back and made big kid player, I think it was, or MVP at least. So he was a, he was a character and still is. We had a lot of a lot of characters. A lot of fun. It's just a, amazing, at the amazing time, run At the time, talent. I about thought it was fun, but it turned out to be. You mentioned Scott Skiles earlier. Can you think of another player or two, whether they were a native Hoosier or from out state, who you recruited like crazy and didn't get, and then now you have to coach against them? What's that like? Well, it's horrible because they beat you. Uh, Alan Henderson was another one. I really wanted him bad. He went to Indiana and beat us regularly. So uh, uh, I can't think of many others, but there were, had to be some others, and I just can't remember their all the names. Did you try to recruit Steve Alford? Oh yeah, yeah, hard. Yeah, he beat us did up you, pretty good. He's a hell of a shooter. Did but you Knight feel, did a great job getting it? Knight did a great coach. Knight did a great job getting them open. They set good screens, and they were legal. Did you ever yell at the refs that maybe they weren't legal? Oh yeah. <laughs> of course. <laughs> when it came to Indiana players, did you feel like you had an advantage, like for for uh, players in the northern part of the state who who maybe wouldn't want to drive all the way down to Kentucky or IU or a place like that? No, I just thought that uh, you know Kentucky and Indiana and uh, all those schools are great recruiting schools. So no, I never thought we had an advantage. It was just hard work. They had to keep worse selling and watching them play and working on their parents and their families. So staying positive. You are listening to Leaders and Legends, a podcast presented by Veteran Strategies, a local veteran public relations enterprise and sponsored by Girl Scouts of Central Indiana, Garmon Construction, the Crown Plaza Hotel and Grand Hall and Conference Center at Historic Union Station, the law firm of Bose, McKinney, and Evans, and the Bose Public Affairs Group, the McGinley's Golden Ace Inn, and McAllister Machinery, your friendly neighborhood Caterpillar dealer. 
we've talked to, obviously, we're here with Coach Gene Cady of Purdue, member of the College Basketball Hall of Fame. We talked about basketball at Purdue, but take a minute or two, please, in our final moments to discuss what was like being at Purdue University. Did you enjoy it? Were there things about the campus and the town and the surrounding area that you really enjoyed as well? Oh, yeah. Not, that's the reason I stayed there. I love the people I work with. Bob DeMoss, George King, Dr. Combs, on and on and on, John DeCamp, uh, all of them. That's the reason I had a lot of chances to leave Purdue, but I couldn't because it was too special. It was too cut into basketball. And, and I love football there, too. I love Jim Young when he coached there and uh, Joe mm-hmm. Tiller. So it was a situation where in the, and the baseball coach and I were very close. So uh, – I enjoyed track too and, and swimming. The swimming coach and I still talk, so former swimming coach. So uh, it was just a special place because I, I, I'd been to enough schools to know that, that not, pe- not, not, not many people had that situation. So I just appreciated what I, opportunity I had, so I stuck with it. You said you had opportunities to leave. How close did you come and uh, where were those opportunities? Arizona State and uh, um, Kansas State and uh, uh, San Francisco. So we get back from Arizona State, and uh, my wife went with me. And uh, we get home, and they offered me the job. And I got home. I said, "Well, we got to go home and think about it." They flew us back on a jet, and we get back. And that night, we're think sitting in our beds thinking about the job. And we had dogs. We loved dogs, and. Uh, she said, I don't know if the dogs can take the heat in Arizona. I said, what are you talking about? That's it. We're not going. So <laughs> that's that on that argument. <laughs> in 2000, after 25 years at Purdue, you kind of cap off with an amazing role as assistant coach for the Dream Team in the Sydney Olympics. Yes. The U.S. team won the gold medal. Please give a give us some thoughts on that experience. Well, it just um, it's hard to explain because it's so special. I still wear the ring. They don't give coaches medals; they give them rings. So the two thousand, it was a special time. The players were all easy to coach because they listened, and we had great head coach Rudy Tomjanovich. Uh, Larry Brown was assistant. Tubby Smith was assistant. So. I had great guys working with them, and uh, uh, the players were very uh, – Jason Kidd and uh, Kevin Garnett and on and on and on. So uh, it was just a special time. Marching into the Olympics is so special, it uh, almost makes you cry. So uh, it's, a, it's a situation where I was, I've always will cherish it, appreciate the fact that USA Basketball helped pick me as one of the assistants and – I've always thought that was something that uh, you'll never uh, have an opportunity to do again. How did you get selected to be a part of the staff? Well, I coached, a, like I told you, the tur- uh, in Colorado Springs, the, the east-west, uh, south-north thing that they developed late players. And then uh, Beheim and I, 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 helped, I asked Jim Beheim to help me coach the World University team in Germany. And we won that gold medal. Um, um, we, so, uh, so, so now you've gone from the East, West, South, North thing to, to the world university games. And then they picked me to coach the Pan Am team in Cuba. And that's where Castro was at every game. And, uh, uh, we got the bronze medal in that game. And, uh, we got beat by, uh, Puerto Rico who had three NBA players on it. And we only had college kids, but they beat us. And, they, and it was a good game. I think they beat us few points. I'm not sure how much it was, but on that team was Tony Bennett, the, the coach in Virginia. And uh, he's just, he's just, uh, he's always a special guy. His dad was the coach at Wisconsin and uh, has always been a special person in my life because after we got beat, then we won the next game for third against Cuba, which was, we beat Cuba twice in that tournament, but didn't win the game we won to the gold medal game. But anyway, cause we can get to play it. But, uh, Tony was one of those guys that was a special guy to coach, great point guard, tremendous coach now, as you know, at Virginia. Came to my uh, 
apartment where we had they had bungalows there for us to stay and for the coaches in uh, Cuba. He came to my and wanted to know if I was okay. Here's a player coming to check out see if the coach is okay. So, yeah, Tony, I'm okay. Don't worry about it. We got beat, and uh, we'll be fine. And it turned out he was fine. He won a national title here, what, a couple of years ago, didn't he? So, so uh, it, it was just a special. That's why we, that's how I got to be an Olympic coach, because of success in other USA tournaments. What's it like to be out of coaching and watch games, whether it's, I know you did some Big Ten, Big Ten Network uh, uh, commentating, and uh, but just to sit and, and I know you've been very active in your retirement and we want to talk about that for a second before we let you go. But to watch the NCAA tournament and not have a chance to play in it, is it something you enjoy or is it something that you just can't bring yourself to do? No, I love watching it. I, I appreciate it. Uh, sorry, we can't watch this year. Uh, you know, uh Next year's in Indianapolis, so I can't wait for that. But uh, uh, Big Ten Network was a great gig. That was the best gig maybe I ever had. Work, work, there's really? great people there to work for. They're, they're unbelievable. So that was fun doing TV after I retired from coaching. So I uh, had some good jobs after I left uh, Purdue. Went to Toronto for a year. Uh, worked for Jim Todd there. He's a... Uh, uh, well, I worked for Sam Mitchell, but Jim Todd and I were the assistants together, and I still talk to Jim. He still comes. He comes to Myrtle Beach, and plays golf with him once in a while, or has once at least. And uh, then got the Big Ten Network, and then went to St. John's to work for Steve Lavin. So I've been pretty lucky since I retired from Purdue to have other jobs I enjoy. What's it like to shoot your age in golf? Pardon? What's it like to shoot your age playing golf? How'd you know that? Wow. I well, we do no research here now. at the it's, No secrets, is it? Uh, <laughs> it was fun. Yeah, the guy I played with his name is Jim Beach, and uh, he said, Coach, if you make this putt, I did make about a three-footer, you make this putt, you shot your age, which was one of my goals, you know. And It was an 83. It wasn't a great score, but it was still for me. You know, I was 83, and I shot my age. So that was pretty – for me, it was special. And uh, Jim says, if you make this putt, you shoot, you shot, shoot your age. So that was pretty – that was fun. Did you feel well, some now pressure I there? About 88. I shoot about 88 on the average. Is it hard for someone who – none of us can believe that Bob Knight played golf. Like, that would seem to be the worst game possible <laughs> for him to take up. Are you a better no, golfer okay. than Coach I played Knight? With it. Pardon? Are you a better golfer than Coach Knight? I don't know. No, I'm not a better golfer than anybody. <laughs> <laughs> but but for a coach, you know, what's frustrating about golf is as you get older, you can't play as good. That's the most frustrating thing. I used to hit the ball about 280 on the drive. Now I can't hit it. If I have a par three 160, I have to use my driver. So it's like, wow, where'd that go? So you know, <laughs> golf's about touch and practicing, like anything else. It's about muscle memory. It's like get, it's like shooting jumpers. You know, Mark Montes wrote my book. I was going to ask you um, about that. Passion Play. Passion a book play. came out. It was about your 1987 and, uh, season. Is that correct? Yeah. yeah and, and you guys I won a share Mark. of the Big Ten Championship that year. Yeah, he followed me around all year. In the end up like we wanted it, but it was, it was got, we got close. But anyway, close doesn't count. Not horseshoes. Anyway, uh, I called Mark the other day and said, Mark, I want to write another book. He said, what are you talking about? He says, well, I want to write a book called Soft Touch. He said, okay, well, give me some circumstances. I said, well, soft, you got to have soft touch in your putts, right? You got to have soft touch in your jumpers. And I was a soft touch as a coach. <laughs> so, <laughs> he, he said, well, I'll consider it, but I haven't heard back from him. So I wouldn't be a good seller. I'm going to throw some names out on your coaching tree. Bruce Weber, Kevin Stallings, Steve Lavin, Matt Painter, Conzo Martin, Link Darner, and there are a few others. What's it like to see Austin Parker. your f- – Kip That's Jones. right. That's right. Yeah. What's it like to see what? your former players and people who you've come to know and love over the years try to succeed in such a high-pressure 
profession? Well, do, I love it because uh, I, I know that they're, I'm surprised he became a coach. He had to be under me, first of all. <laughs> but uh, they're, it's it's fun to watch them, but, but at the same time, this is frustrating if they lose because I know what they're going through at home and they're not – they don't like it and they don't want to be involved in losing and it's no fun to be part of that when you lose, but it's just part of the job. You got to learn to cope with it. But, uh, I love watching them and I love what going to the games if I'm in the vicinity to see them. But Brandon Brantley is the assistant coach at Purdue and he played for me and I'm always yelling him about something. That I didn't teach you to do that. He says, coach, <laughs> they don't listen like they used to. I said, well, whose fault's that? I said, what would you do if you didn't lose it? He said, listen, I said, you wouldn't play. So it's like, but I guess times have changed. I don't know. But anyway, Matt Painter's a great coach, and uh, I enjoy watching his teams play. Purdue has had two men's basketball head coaches in the last 40 years. That's pretty remarkable in this day and age. Yes, it is. As you think about it, it yes. I got lucky and was there 25, and now he's been there 15. So uh, special – Special guy, special from a special family. You know, he went home his first after his first week being a practice. And said his dad's a lawyer and was a lawyer in Muncie, and uh, the dad. I don't know if Coach Key knows what the hell he's doing. And his dad said, "Oh, I'm sure he wants to play the worst player. Shut up, get back to campus, and go to class <laughs> and be quiet." <laughs> so so uh, his dad straightened him out real quick, and it worked out pretty well for him. It was just I a few months ago. I to, to Morgan Burke to be, take the job. Well, Painter's done an absolutely terrific job. He's a heck of a coach, yes, and I don't care who you root for. You have to admire and acknowledge excellence, and he certainly qualifies. Just a few months ago, you were involved in a very special day. Part of it happened at Assembly Hall when Coach Knight came back after 20-plus years, after 20 years. And then you were both honored at an Indiana Pacers game that night. Uh, talk to yes. us a little bit about that day and what it was like to see you're at Assembly Hall. Coach Knight comes back to Assembly Hall. Purdue ends up beating IU. Then you travel up to Indianapolis, and the two of you are at center court uh, on behalf of the Indiana Pacers in their Indiana Day in basketball. What was that like? Well, first of all, I really appreciated the Indiana players' uh, surrounding coach and bringing him into the assembly hall that was fun to watch and respected that a lot so that was fun fun to see and hope it happens again at some point and then that night at the Pacers game it was special to be able to be introduced with him and be part of anything we do I do with coach Knight is special so uh, that was fun I appreciated the fact they invited us we end all they podcasts. They sent me a jersey. They sent me an Indiana Pacers jersey. I, they framed and mailed to me. It's got number one in the back of it. I'm not sure I'm number one, but that was very much appreciated too. So I got it here in my uh, man cave. Well, you're number one in a lot of things at Purdue, including all-time winningest coach. And you're certainly your record at the Big Ten was almost unparalleled and only Coach Knight and Coach Izzo in the modern times can compare to it and anyone who loves good basketball appreciated your career at Purdue and how hard your teams played and it is interesting as you said earlier the the days of the IU Purdue basketball games the intensity you could feel and I can only say in Indianapolis was was so palpable like everybody was on edge because everybody wanted to be the one who could talk smack the following day sure on the golf course next summer. <laughs> That's where you caught it. If you got beat. <laughs> you are listening to the Leaders and Legends podcast. We are joined today by an absolute all-time great, and that's Purdue basketball coach Gene Cady. Coach Cady, we end the podcast with the same five questions to everybody. So Purdue okay. president Mitch Daniels answered these, and everyone gets them. And uh, if you're ready for them, I'll give them to you. Okay, I'm ready. Go ahead. If you could, excuse me, your first one is, what was your first job? The job was uh, at Beloit High School in Beloit, Kansas, 1958. 
do you remember your first concert? Uh, concert. Wow. Well, yeah, it was a high school concert. We used to have what they called assemblies in those days. They take take us to a London high school to listen to uh, orchestras come to town, and we it was like 1952. Yes. I always enjoyed watching all the different instruments. Wasn't any good at music, but I enjoyed watching <laughs> listen. Number three, if you could recommend any book for someone to read, which book would you choose? Well, of course, the first one would be the Bible. Uh, boy, I've, led a, I've read a lot of good ones lately. Um, uh, one of the ones I'm reading right now I read was uh, Why the Best of the Best. And, uh, and I and read so many, I read like seven books in the last five months. So I'm getting ready. I'm reading the Yankee years right now. I'm getting ready to read Bill Walton. Uh, a friend of mine across the street here brought me five books to read that he knows I like history. So yeah, uh, I knew you're a history uh, buff. Yeah. I like, I love history. Uh, it's one of those things that, uh, Bud Presley taught me the junior college coach of California. I talked about earlier, uh, it's just history is something special that just read a book about the civil war. Uh, that was very interesting, tough, tough times. And that was, uh, not good for our country, but we went through it to get better. Did you read a Mark Monteith's book, passion play on your 1987 season? Oh yeah, I read it. Didn't like it, but I read it, but I didn't like what <laughs> the results were. <laughs> I liked the way he wrote, but I didn't like the one ended, way it ended. He's incredibly talented. I have to ask, yes, did you is. read uh, the book, A Season on the Brink? Oh, yeah. Yep. yep, yep. Of course I did. I had to keep you up with my uh, enemy. <laughs> <laughs> my, I should say competitor. <laughs> I was reading that book. I was uh, A Season on the Brink. I was uh, standing in the uh, sitting in the Indianapolis airport. It was 1987. I had flown home uh, on leave from the Army. And uh -huh. I'm reading that book and I look up and the person who is standing five feet in front of me, just standing there with his teammates was a guy named Michael Jordan. <laughs> wow. And I had, I had just read the part in the book about Jordan playing for coach Knight during the Olympics. And I looked up yeah. and I just laughed and said, I just got done reading about you. And he's Jordan <laughs> looked at me and he goes, is that book any good? I'm like, Oh, it's real good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that was I got before Michael the, Jordan's picture in my man cave here, right by me. So, anyway, great guy, great friend. Maybe, the, maybe the, one of the best players in the history of the game, no doubt. Question number four. If you could witness any event in history, be there in person as it happens, which event would you choose? Oh, wow, that's a good one. A Super Bowl, World Series, a National Championship game in basketball. I'd like to see all those. Would you like to see the something along the lines of the signing of the Declaration of Independence or Lincoln giving the Gettysburg Address? Oh, yeah. Of course I would. Naturally. Final question. If you could have dinner with anyone living today, two hours wow. off the record to talk about anything, whom would you choose? Anyone living oh, today? Man. That's a good question. Parody. Golf. Golf. Uh, Golf uh, channel uh, analyst. Fair, you know are you him? Gonna, yeah, are you going to go on his show? He had Coach Knight on his show. I don't know. I've been invited. <laughs> uh, but I want to meet Danny on uh, Blue Bloods. And I want to meet Hank Boyd on Chicago PD. Well, that's not a bad list at all. We we We've had so many great people on the podcast to be candid people given of their time, whether it's Mitch Daniels or current governor, Eric Holcomb. We've, we've had medal of honor recipient, uh, Sammy Davis from Mooresville on, and we cannot thank you enough for adding your name to this list of people who've taught us about themselves, taken us through their own personal journey and history. And I honestly cannot tell you what an amazing honor it is to be able to speak with you, coach. Thank you so very much. Well, thank you, and I feel the same way about talking to you. I was going through one of my uh, wife's boxes here the other day, and it had a purple heart in it. It says, 
who is this? He says, my dad, he was shot down in World War II in a, in a uh, fight in a uh, bomber plane in Switzerland, and he got a Purple Heart. He got shot in the neck. I said, oh, my God, that's a bigger honor than I ever got. So, you know, a- wow. Abs- so those- absolutely. Absolutely. Yep. And uh, if I'm up at Purdue buying my son lunch one day and you happen to be around, uh, oh, I'll, I'll happy to. to spring for a meal. What did you say he's majoring in? He's in the aviation school. He's learning to be a pilot oh, like one of your ex-players, uh, oh, Tony. Yeah, yeah, Tony. Well, they flew me a lot of places recruiting. The aviation school special in my heart. They, they took me a lot of places. Well, I'll pass yep. that along to him. And thank you very, very much. And we appreciate oh. you coming on the Leaders and Legends podcast. Well, thank you. You made my year. Thank you. (laughs) Thank you, Coach. Take care. Okay. Thank you very much for listening to Leaders and Legends, brought to you by Veteran Strategies Incorporated. If you want to contact us about this program or our menu of public relations services, please send us an email at robert at veteranstrategies.com. That's robert at veteranstrategies.com. Thank you.